Let us begin with a reading from a papal document by Blessed Pius IX, which declared St. Joseph the patron of the Universal Church. Blessed Pius IX, Pope of Holy Memory, wrote the following, quote, As Almighty God appointed Joseph, son of the patriarch Jacob, over the land of Egypt to save grain for the people, so when the fullness of time had come, and he was about to send to earth his only begotten son, the Savior of the world, he chose another Joseph, of whom the first had been a type, and he made him the Lord and chief of his household and his possessions, the guardian of his choicest treasures. Indeed, he had as his spouse the Immaculate Virgin Mary, of whom was born by the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ our Lord, who deigned to be reputed in the sight of men as the son of Joseph and subject to him. The Pope continues, Him whom countless kings and prophets had desired to see, Joseph not only saw, but conversed with and embraced in paternal affection and kissed. He most diligently reared him, whom the faithful were to receive as the bread that came down from heaven, whereby they might obtain eternal life. Because of this sublime dignity, the sublime dignity which God conferred on his most faithful servant, the church is always most highly honored and praised Blessed Joseph next to his spouse, the Virgin Mother of God, and has besought his intercession in times of trouble. The Pope then concludes, And now, therefore, when in these most troublesome times the church is beset by enemies on every side and is weighed down by calamity so heavy that ungodly men assert that the gates of hell have at last prevailed against her. The venerable prelates of the whole Catholic world have presented to the sovereign pontiff their own petitions and those of the faithful committed to their charge, praying that he would deign to constitute St. Joseph patron of the church, unquote. St. Paul, in one of his letters, calls Catholics the ambassadors of Christ. And so with this in mind, calling them ambassadors of Christ, the church might be seen as the embassy of Christ. I mean, ambassadors are part of an embassy, right? Our dearest Lord once said to his chosen disciples, his chosen ambassadors, he stated, he that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me. The embassy of the church does not represent some foreign power on earth, but rather that land which is not of this world, namely the kingdom of heaven. This is an eternal kingdom that rises above all other nations. But like any embassy or diplomatic mission, the church is to be represented by its ambassadors for the best interest of the homeland, which is heaven. The church must sustain the cause of the master of the universe by proclaiming his holy law, by defending his interests, by causing his name to be respected, even reverenced, and to protect his glory, and to prevent any outrages committed against the king, the majesty. And yes, the embassy of the church also dispenses all the blessings and the graces of heaven upon those nations and peoples of goodwill. But besides protecting the rights of God, the church's diplomatic mission, if you will, is to make the children of Adam, to make the children of Adam, the children of this world, to make them the adopted children of God the Father in Jesus Christ. And that thus prepares them to enter into the kingdom that lasts forever. The church militant is called to extend the territory of Christ, to manifest his social reign as king over men, and to consecrate this world to Christ by renewing the face of the earth by the power of the Holy Ghost. Quite 
a mission for the embassy of the church. Now, an embassy is considered, as many of you know, the sovereign territory of the power that has established it. That is why U.S. embassies have a marine guard that provides armed security to protect the embassy and the diplomatic mission from attack. I mean, it's U.S. territory. In recent decades, the United States has witnessed tragedies where these properties have been the object of attack. From Saigon in 1975, from Tehran in 1979, until the most recent Benghazi attack, we have seen embarrassing evacuations, hostage takings, and yes, the brutal murders and torture and mistreatment of our own ambassadors and diplomats and other State Department officials. A nation begins to show its weakness when it cannot protect its interests in a foreign land. The leader of the nation becomes an object of ridicule. The white flag is raised, the embassy is invaded, and then comes the surrender. And so in regards to the embassy of the church, we have witnessed various diplomatic disasters, if you will, in this modern age. Instead of defending the interests of our king, like a loyal marine guard, we have allowed him to be insulted, mocked, and, yes, despised by various rebellious subjects and enemies. We have largely dismissed and even disdained the religious patrimony left to us by all the ancient saints, the church fathers. Called to be members of a church militant, we have become impotent members as we idly stand by as the cause of Christ loses more and more ground. And we find ourselves often embarrassed, embarrassed by the teachings of the past, the church fathers, the doctors, and the magisterial giants of older times. Over the past centuries, not just the past few decades, there has been one surrender after another until there's been a virtual white flag raised over the cupola of St. Peter's Basilica. And one of the first major surrenders was to the ideology, and that's the right word, the ideology of scientism. The church has always been, as you know, the great patron of science, of course. And without her presence and support, science would never have truly advanced. But as modern man supposedly became ever more scientific, more enlightened, he began just to dismiss that higher body of knowledge known as divine revelation. Scientism, the ideology. The surrender came, for example, when the church began to embrace, in some of her membership, evolutionism, an ideology, almost a religion. Whether in the origin of the universe or the origin of species, the church was invaded by Big Bang theories and Darwinism. The fathers of the church and our ancestors of old rejected all pagan notions of a destructive, disordered story of creation. The pagans believed in a very chaotic, explosive creation. Church fathers rejected that. That's not how God works. Rather, we accepted the fiat creation, the notion that God spoke and it was made. He said, it, let it be, and things came forth perfectly formed. But modern Catholics, by and large, stood idly by as God was turned into some sort of destructive force that brings creation about by explosions and brings about a body for man after eons of death and countless corpses. The God of evolution is a God of death. Death is part of the plan of evolution. It's needed for the next, more advanced species to come about. But the God of the Bible, the God of tradition, is a God of life, a God of beauty, artistic perfection, and order. Every father of the church, without exception, 
would look upon evolutionism not just as erroneous, not just as illogical, not just as unphilosophical, but also blasphemous because it reflects horribly upon the divine majesty, making death disease a part of his original plan. But these men of old were not like us. They were true marine guards. Whereas many modern-day Catholics surrender, we love to raise the white flag, and therefore we have a Benghazi-like event in the church. Two more white flags were raised over the embassy of the church, denoting another surrender, one after the other, this time in the area of sacred scripture and what is called the ecclesiology, or the study of the church. Again, the great saints, the doctors, the popes, the councils of the church have always stated definitively that the Holy Bible is totally inerrant, without any errors whatsoever. But this notion of completely being without error, complete inerrancy, seems to be a problem with most modern Catholics who suggest only partly inerrant. Maybe inerrant when it comes to faith matters and perhaps morality, but never to historical matters or science. Of course, with God being the primary author of sacred scripture itself, these modern Catholics knowingly or unknowingly attribute error to God himself. Did Jacob have 12 sons? Historical fact? He better have. Catholics, we surrender and we surrender. Furthermore, our spiritual ancestor is held strong on the doctrine that there was one true faith and only one true church that could bring men to salvation. They believed in that dogma, which is known as extra ecclesiam nullisalus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. And their missionary efforts in the world demonstrated this belief. They actually went out and they preached because they realized that men could not be saved without Christ and his Catholic church. They wanted to bring men into the bark of Peter, into the saving ark the Roman Catholic Church. But now, we have many Catholics, even high-ranking prelates, who tell us that the church is supposedly a larger entity than we originally thought, including many non-Catholic groups within the people of God. The idea of conversion to Catholicism is frowned upon. Just be a good Baptist. Just be a good Buddhist, a good Jew, a good Muslim. And so we're told that conversion to Catholicism is somehow outdated. It's a thing of the past. Rather, modern churchmen look for what they call an ecumenical convergence, where all religions sort of come together and form some sort of future church. But the liturgical surrender was especially painful. You know, all our ancestors, at least in the Latin rite, worshipped at the traditional Latin Mass. Its Gregorian chant, its sacred language, its proper orientation, turning towards the good Lord, was brought to many corners of the earth, to barbarians in northern Europe, to primitive Indian tribes and African tribes, to aboriginal peoples on Pacific islands, and yet the liturgy remained largely the same. But when the Western world was at its highest level of education and learning back in the 60s and 70s, when we were landing people on the moon, when literacy rates soared and books and computers were available to many, the traditional Latin mass all of a sudden became too much for modern man. Modern religions told us that the ancient mass wasn't relative, it wasn't entertaining enough, it could no longer relate to the people. We would have to surrender, surrender to a modern culture with a new modern rite that supposedly was far more appealing. Everyday down-to-earth language was used for liturgical prayer. Contemporary music, which mimicked what the world offered, even though the world did it better than we did. 
Table altars with the priest acting as perhaps a host. New missiles, new rituals, new blessings, new theology, new everything would all prove to be vital in a new evangelization. It would be a new springtime if we did this. It would be a new Pentecost. Well, this surrender has proven to be a total failure as pews become empty due to the exodus of Catholics from the embassy of the church. Well, despite all of these white flags being raised outside our embassy, many quote-unquote conservative Catholics were not that concerned because at least the church held strong on morality, on natural law matters, on pro-life, pro-marriage issues. And so being pro-life and in favor of traditional marriage became the badge of Catholic identity. The only litmus test, it seemed, was holding to the fifth and sixth commandments. That's how far we've retreated. At least we're holding on to the natural law, sort of. That's how much we've surrendered. At least we're pro-life, pro-marriage. But in recent years, it seems that we're having yet another further retreat, a further surrender. Think about it. Barely a peep was heard from prelates regarding the fate of poor Terry Schiavo. This woman was in her mid-40s. Yes, she was limited mentally, but she was very much alive. She was in no way dying. And yet she was starved and dehydrated to death. And we were told by the bishop in the diocese where she was murdered that we have to understand that there's complex issues here. Pro-abortion Catholics, as we know, politicians go uncorrected as they receive Holy Communion regularly and are even awarded honorary degrees from various Catholic institutions. Sterilizations, dear people, are performed in Catholic institutions and hospitals in the West. That's a reality. And yes, we see some hospice groups accused of literally euthanizing the terminally ill. And then there's those issues of internal organ transplants, non-paired vital organs that have to be harvested from the individual who still is alive. And we're told not to be overly obsessed with pro-life matters. Don't be overly obsessed with marriage issues. And so the annulment mill continues to churn out positive decrees to such an extent that, at least in the States, they call it Catholic divorce. The problem of the contraceptive mentality is rarely touched upon in sermons. Pope Paul VI wrote a sort of a okay, somewhat weak document called Humani Vitae, talking about responsible parenthood. And yet, after the outcry against that fairly weak document, he never wrote another encyclical for the next and last ten years of his papacy. We're told that we don't have to act like rabbits, do we? Many prelates speak out against sodomitical Marriages, but they seem to be fine with sodomitical unions. I mean, for insurance purposes, of course. And then there's the issue of public adulterers being free to receive the sacraments after a time of discernment and accompaniment. Are we still fully pro-life? Are we still fully pro-marriage? But there are those who say... Don't worry about it. The Holy Ghost is still in charge. There's no surrender here. There never will be. But how many more white flags do we need to see before we admit that there might be some problem? In fact, we could even go further and say that many members of the church have not just raised the white flag and surrendered, but have even promoted and applauded the invasion of the enemy. Case in point, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you might have heard him, a famous Russian author and writer. Solzhenitsyn was an outspoken critic, as many of you know, of the Soviet Union. 
and its totalitarian government. Furthermore, this author was very critical of the forced labor camps that brought death and devastation to many of the Russian people. And Solzhenitsyn's literary classic, its masterpiece, was entitled The Gulag Archipelago. In one passage from that famous book, Solzhenitsyn recounts a political rally where the featured speaker was no less than Comrade Stalin. And after Stalin's speech, it was expected that the members of the audience would give him a rousing standing ovation, especially if they wished to avoid possible arrest or persecution. And so the stormy applause began and extended after this speech for three minutes. Then the applause continued for five minutes, then eight minutes of non-stop clapping. And men's hands began to hurt. They struggled to keep up their false enthusiasm, and yet they kept clapping 10 minutes, 11 minutes, and no one dared to be the first one to stop clapping in the presence of the beloved leader. That might suggest that they did not support the cult of Stalin's personality. But at the 12th minute, the 12th minute, one man, a director of a local factory, was the first one to stop clapping. And the others in the audience were relieved that they could stop their wearisome applause. Solzhenitsyn then added the following information. Quote, that same night, that factory director was arrested. They sentenced him to 10 years of hard labor on the pretext of something quite different. But after the factory director had signed the official governmental form, admitting his guilt, his interrogator reminded the former factory director, saying, hey, buddy, don't ever be the first one to stop applauding. Over the last number of decades, we've had a mandatory enthusiasm. A compulsory optimism has been imposed upon Catholic people. Not just to surrender, not just raising the white flag, but our applause were expected. For to stop clapping might suggest that we're somehow against the reform, against the changes. So for the most part, the Catholic faithful surrendered and they applauded. We clapped through the liturgical revolution, which brought devastation. What to do to our children, our grandchildren? We applauded the new order of things, the new orientations, the new directions, the new theology. And though there seemed to be a contradiction with our past, although it seemed to be at odds with the faith and practice of our ancestors, though there was seemingly a rupture, we didn't stop clapping. But as the years passed, the clapping became wearisome, especially as enthusiasm waned. Ten years, twenty years, even 50 years of applause can become wearisome. The faithful saw pews begin to empty. They saw the schools that they went to close before their children could go there. They saw their Catholic colleges that they gave money to become completely secularized. They saw their grandchildren remaining unbaptized. They saw their Catholic neighbors joining non-Catholic megachurches. And yes, they saw their one-time parish churches being sold to non-Catholic groups to be formed into restaurants, pubs, or perhaps mosques with minarets. The faithful then saw the sisters, the nuns, take off their habits, perm their hair, leave their enclosure, and even skip out totally on religious life. And then many priests, many priests, removed their collars and even became laicized, while some who did remain the clergy were at times at best effeminate or at worst pederasts. The Catholic Church in this country alone has lost 
more than 36% of its membership. 36% of Catholics have left the Catholic faith. 45% of Catholics have never received their first confession. One out of every six Americans is a former Catholic. Former Catholics are the second largest religious group in this nation. Devastation. Nothing less than devastation. And it is at a time like this that we need St. Joseph. If he is the universal patron of the church, as he held the Christ child in his strong and capable arms, providing for his needs, so Joseph holds the mystical body of Christ, which is only the Catholic Church, in his strong and capable hands. You know, it's said that St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic, the doctor of the church, brought a statue of St. Joseph on all of her journeys when she was about to found a new monastery. But on one particular occasion, St. Teresa and numerous Carmelite sisters were seated in a group of carriages on their way to found a new convent. The coachmen driving the carriages were struggling to find a proper path. And the story goes that they were beginning to lose their way. St. Teresa looked at the coachmen and she saw anxiety, fear in their faces. A moment later, the men driving the carriages began heading down a very steep slope, which might have been good enough for mountain goats, but in no way was proper for their wide, heavy carriages. St. Teresa sensed danger. And so like a captain in a storm ordering the sails to be pulled in and calling for all hands on deck, St. Teresa ordered her sisters to suppress their fear and to pray for God's protection, especially to good St. Joseph. St. Teresa then stated the following, quote, Those coachmen driving this carriage no longer know what they're doing. Let us commit ourselves to prayer. And let us ask our Lord and our Father, St. Joseph, to guide us. And while they were still praying, a voice was heard yelling from the very bottom of the ravine that they were headed towards. And that strong, manly voice said to the carriage coachman, Stop! Stop! You will overturn the carriages and roll down a cliff if you go that way. And all of a sudden, everything came to an abrupt halt, as if the very hand of God had stopped the carriages from careening off the cliff into the abyss below. The coachman and the mules were in a state of panic. They had been saved by this warning voice of a man coming from the depths of the chasm below. But how were they to get out of their present dangerous situation? How were they to turn around on this narrow path and avoid further disaster? How were they to find the right road again? So the coachman cried out to the man below, where can we find a safe path to follow? And from the bottom of that cliff, once again, a deep manly voice was heard that provided the answer. Go back gently. Go backwards gently. There's no danger in that. If you go back a hundred turns of the wheel, you will find the right track again. And the coachman did as they were told, and they found safe passage. But when they sought out that man who had saved them from falling into the abyss, they could find no one. But St. Teresa's face was radiant with joy and with tears of love. For she knew who had saved them. She told her sisters, I don't like letting those coachmen go on looking for that man because they're not going to find anybody. But we can't tell them that the voice we heard was our father Joseph. He answered our prayers. Oh, how we need good St. Joseph to call out to us in the hierarchy 
coachman, if you will, driving this carriage, bring us towards a cliff to tell them to stop. This is not a safe path that you are taking. Stop, for you're heading towards disaster, and you will need to go back. You'll need to go back to tradition, correct your mistakes, and travel the sure path which the saints have followed. People say, Father, you can't go back. You can't turn back the clock. <laughs> well, as G.K. Chesterton said, actually, you can turn back a clock. You take it off the wall and you, you, you use the dials. You can't remake your bed. Get to sleep in it. No, you don't. You could actually remake your bed. You can go back. You can retrace your steps and correct your mistakes. You know, there's a line from sacred scripture from the book of Proverbs, which every traditional Catholic should know. The book of Proverbs, the line reads the following, quote, Pass not beyond the ancient boundaries which thy fathers have set. Pass not beyond the ancient boundaries which your fathers have set. Commenting on this short passage from Proverbs, St. Cyril of Alexandria stated that we must always be united with the faith of the past, that church teachings never are to change, changed by, especially by future generations, never going beyond the boundaries that the ancients have set. In short, there's never to be a generational gap when it comes to being a divide between Catholics of different ages in regards to the Holy Faith. St. Cyril then writes, quote, For it is not allowable for anyone to change even one word, nor allow one syllable to be passed over. Mindful of that saying from Proverbs, Pass not beyond the ancient boundaries set by your fathers. This is also the command given by popes. Popes of old, including Pope St. Leo the Great, who stated, The faith shall never change in any age. For one is the faith which justifies the just of all ages. It is unlawful to, di to differ even in a single word from the teachings of the apostles. Unquote. Past church councils continue this theme. Vatican I stated the following, the understanding of its sacred dogmas must be perpetually retained, which Holy Mother Church has once declared. And there must never be a change from that meaning under the false name of a deeper understanding. Modern men like to use that term. Well, we have a deeper understanding that the men of old have had. And yes, it is the unchanging position taken by the greatest of all the church doctors, namely the common doctor, the universal doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas. Ite Thomas, go to Thomas to receive the best explanation. St. Thomas taught the following, our faith is identical with that of the ancients. Deny this and you dissolve the unity of the church. It's no longer one. We must hold this for certain, that the faith of the people of the present day, 13th century for him, is one with the faith of the people of past centuries. And were this not true, Thomas adds, then we would not be the same church as they were. But let's face facts. The coachmen have seemingly driven us beyond the boundaries that the ancients have set. And we're headed towards a cliff. Although there are many examples to choose from, perhaps the most serious, the most egregious departure from tradition, the most serious rupture is in the area of the study of the church the one true church, also known as ecclesiology. As mentioned before, the dogma extra ecclesia nulla salus, or outside the church there is no salvation, 
has been watered down so much to the point that membership in the church is virtually meaningless for salvation. Or that the Catholic Church is only the privileged path, the best path to salvation, as opposed to the only path of salvation. And furthermore, church membership itself has seemingly expanded. Before, one had to be baptized. One had to embrace the entire Catholic faith. And one had to be under the legitimate shepherds or bishops of the church to be considered a member of the true church. But now it seems that anyone can fall under the big umbrella of the people of God. I guess we're now a big tent church. St. Joseph, ora pro nobis, pray for us and pray especially for the members of the hierarchy. The Catholic Church is not a denomination. It is not some sort of Christian denomination. Rather, she is the one and only church, the one and only mystical body of Christ. The body of Christ mentioned in the scriptures is identical to the Catholic Church today. The one kingdom of God on earth, in purgatory, and in heaven is the Catholic Church. Catholicism, therefore, is Christianity. Christianity is Catholicism. They are synonymous terms, synonyms. Catholicism, Christianity. And as a result, only Catholics embrace the true Christian faith in its fullest extent. No one who dissents from the Roman Catholic Church can be truly, fully, completely Christian. In one of his great papal letters, Pope Leo XIII taught the following. The Pope said, so long as the member was on the body, it lived. Separated from the body, it lost its life. Thus the man, he adds, so long as he lives on the body of the Catholic Church, he is a Christian. Separated from her, he becomes a heretic. Consider too what the syllabus of errors written by blessed Pius IX, the wonderful Pope of the 19th century. The syllabus of errors stated a condemnation of this passage. It condemned the, the notion that Protestantism is just another form of Christianity, condemned by the church. Oftentimes today you'll hear Catholics, even members of the hierarchy, refer to themselves as Catholic Christian. I'm sorry, is there any other type than Catholic Christian? Granted, this term Catholic Christian is a very ancient term to distinguish a Christian who accepted the whole Catholic, whole Catholic faith from a heretic who only accepted part of the whole. The term has taken on very erroneous and new meanings today, as if a Catholic Christian is just one element within the life of the church, as would be a Lutheran Christian or a Baptist Christian. Catholic Christian, therefore, has become a ridiculous term, an utterly redundant title, as if I were to say, I am a Christian Christian. A true Christian, a good Catholic, has the faith, whereas a non-Catholic, objectively, does not have the faith at all. And how can I say that? Because of what the common doctor, again, the universal doctor, St. Thomas, teaches. St. Thomas says the following, quote, It is absurd, foolish, for a heretic to say that he believes in Jesus Christ. To believe in a person is to give our full consent to his word and to all that he teaches. True faith, therefore, is absolute belief in Christ and in all he taught. St. Thomas then concludes, Hence, he who does not adhere to all that Jesus Christ has prescribed for our salvation has no more doctrine of Jesus Christ than a pagan, a Jew, or a Muslim. Unquote. A few decades ago, 
I remember being given a wonderful catechism. It's still being printed today. It's a, there's also a PDF on the internet as well. The name of the catechism is Questions and Answers on Salvation by the famous redemptorist Father Michael Mueller. It was put out by Tan Books at one time. Father Mueller was an utterly solid priest and was solid in his presentation on the Holy Faith, especially on questions concerning the one true church. Consider these question and answers that he wrote. Question. Must then all who wish to be saved die united to the Catholic Church? Answer. All those who wish to be saved must die. Note the adverb. Must die united to the Catholic Church. For outside her, there is no salvation. Clear, concise. What drove the missionaries to all corners of the earth. Question number two. Who are outside? the Roman Catholic Church answer. Outside the Roman Catholic Church are all unbaptized and all excommunicated persons, apostates, unbelievers, and heretics, unquote. And then finally, he asked a question, why are true heretics, formal heretics, lost? He answers, true heretics are lost because by rejecting the divine teacher, the Catholic Church, they reject all divine teaching. Then he adds, heretics are lost because they don't have divine faith. They don't have true faith. They have only strong opinions. Again, ecclesial coachmen are careening off the cliff and passengers are in danger of falling into the abyss. All this confusion and doctrinal error regarding the church also leads to practical everyday problems, such as Catholics actively praying in non-Catholic ways. Catholics, even popes, bishops, and priests, violating the first commandment by participating actively in non-Catholic worship. This is against the first commandment. The following fundamentals are desperately needed to be repeated in this very confusing times. That we are not to join actively in public liturgical-like prayer with non-believers. There are some principles we have to put forward. Number one principle, to worship God is necessary for all men. All men must worship God. Second principle, divine revelation has throughout history had a single traditional form of public worship, which alone is right and true. Number three, this proper right and true worship is only found within the Catholic Church. Number four, outside the body of the Catholic Church are found those who are unbaptized, heretics, schismatics, apostates, or the excommunicated who have false worship. Last Principle. Worship offered outside the Catholic Church is false, deviating from the form that alone has been prescribed by God. Men got to worship God. The Catholic Church is the only place where true worship is. You can't worship outside the Catholic Church actively. And considering this question, Catholics joining in non-Catholic public worship the constant teaching of tradition and the church must be maintained. Catholics may never actively participate publicly in non-Catholic worship because it violates the first commandment. We can only have true worship. To do so is not just disordered behavior, but it's also a lie. It's a lie because it seeks to demonstrate a unity that doesn't exist a oneness that's not present. Therefore, it is also scandalous behavior, and it's harmful and uncharitable to one's neighbor. The only allowance granted would be a certain non-active or passive participation, such as attending a funeral of a non-Catholic friend or relative who might have passed away. Blessed Pius IX, 
as I mentioned, to open this conference. Proclaim St. Joseph, the patron of the Universal Church. And he did it during difficult times, he said. In the 19th century. What would he say today? The Pope stated in his document, in these most troublesome times for the church, where the church is beset by enemies on every side and is weighed down by calamities at length so heavy that ungodly men assert that the gates of hell have prevailed against her. The venerable prelates of the whole Catholic world have petitioned and presented the sovereign pontiff that he would deign to make St. Joseph the patron of the Universal Church. And Pius IX did elevate St. Joseph by naming him the Universal Patron. In the minds and the hearts of the faithful, St. Joseph should be exalted because that is what Our Lady wants. The true husband of Mary, the virginal foster father of our Lord and the patron of the Universal Church will bring us his powerful assistance and he will protect and provide for the church as he protected and provided for the Christ child. And yes, he will rebuild. He will rebuild the church in wondrous ways because he also is an expert carpenter. In ending this mission conference this evening, I'd like to consider that miraculous staircase that many of you have read about or perhaps even seen. That miraculous spiral staircase in the chapel of the Loreto Sisters in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The good sisters, it is said, had built a wonderful community chapel, but had forgotten one major detail. They had neglected to connect the choir loft with the nave and the pews 22 feet below. No connection between loft and nave. Seeing this dilemma, the sisters prayed a novena to St. Joseph for a solution. For he is the patron saint of workers as well, especially carpenters. On the ninth and final day of that novena that the nuns prayed, a man all of a sudden appeared, a man riding on a donkey with a toolbox in his hands, and he was looking for work. Many mysteries surround the spiral staircase built in that Loreto Chapel in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Experts say that one man building the structure would have needed at least two years to complete it. But this mystery carpenter can finish the job in a matter of months. Once the staircase was completed, the carpenter could not be found anywhere. He had left without receiving any payment. The wood that he used is only found in the Holy Land, and no type of wood that he used would have been found in New Mexico or in all the Americas. The staircase was magnificent, built in the shape of a double helix with no center pole for support. In other words, the staircase has two 360-degree turns with no visible means of support for the structure itself. It has no nails. It has no glue. Just wooden pegs. The design still perplexes secular experts to this day. And they call it a natural miracle. The good sisters had built a chapel with no connection between the nave where the pews were and the choir loft above. Most people would have criticized the sisters. What are you doing? Who made these plans? But not St. Joseph. No, St. Joseph answered their prayers. And he built a staircase to connect the loft with the nave below. In a real way, he was connecting where the angels were, the loft in heaven, with the world below. The membership of the church today, including the hierarchy, has torn down many traditions. 
that had connected us with the saints of old. And a rupture is present. A disconnect is present between our past and present. We deserve punishment for our infidelity. What are you doing? How could you possibly disconnect the past from this present? But St. Joseph does not condemn us. He will come to our aid. And he will do something even miraculous. As patron of the Universal Church and as a great carpenter, St. Joseph will rebuild the church. Our Lord spoke to St. Francis of Assisi so long ago. He said, Francis, rebuild my church. Heart of Jesus, I adore thee. Heart of Mary, I implore thee. Heart of Joseph, pure and just. In these three hearts, I place my trust. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, in the presence of our dearest Lord, truly, substantially, corporally present in the most blessed of all sacraments in our tabernacles, and with his kind permission, I'd like to begin with a reading from the great Franciscan friar, doctor of the church, St. Bernardine of Siena. He writes the following about good St. Joseph, quote, There is a general rule concerning all special graces granted to any human being. Whenever the divine favor chooses someone to receive a special grace or to accept a lofty vocation, God adorns that person chosen with all the gifts of the Spirit needed to fulfill the task at hand. This general rule is especially verified in the case of St. Joseph, the foster father of our Lord and the husband of the Queen of the World, enthroned above the angels. He was chosen by the Eternal Father as the trustworthy guardian and protector of his highest treasures, namely his divine son and Mary, Joseph's wife. He carried out this vocation with complete fidelity, until at last God called him, saying, Good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. What then is Joseph's position in the whole church of Christ? Is he not a man chosen and set apart? Through him, and yes, under him, Christ was fittingly and honorably introduced into the world. Holy Church in its entirety is indebted to the Virgin Mother because through her it was judged worthy to receive the Christ. But after her, we undoubtedly owe our special gratitude and reverence to St. Joseph. Again, words taken from that Franciscan friar, doctor of the Church, St. Bernardine of Siena. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. A number of years ago, on the continent of Africa, the nation of Kenya to be exact, strange things were happening in the wild. Park rangers, park rangers charged with watching over the wonderful wildlife, were finding numerous carcasses of rhinoceroses in the fields. Initially, they thought that it might have been poachers, but no horns were taken from the giant beasts. And there were additionally no gunshots, no gunshot wounds. Rather, the bodies of these great beasts had literally been trampled to death, crushed nearly flat. In order to solve this mystery, the rangers followed one particular rhino for two days. Towards the afternoon of the second day, three young male elephants were seen coming towards the rhino. First, they began to play around just a bit, but then things got more rough until those young male elephants literally trampled and kicked the rhino to death. The rangers then followed the elephants from a distance until the beasts returned to the herd. And there the park rangers found that the female elephants were acting in nervous and anxious ways. The young males were totally out of control, 
uh, the female and mother elephants were fearful of them and were neglecting their offspring, not even providing them milk for nourishment. What was the answer to this lack of control, this lack of correction, this chaos in the herd? It was the fact that the bull elephant, the elder male, the father figure, if you will, was dead, no longer present. In some cities in the United States, the streets are wild with youth, youth violence being out of control. And those violent situations and these irresponsible youths have almost always one thing in common. Namely, they come from fatherless homes. Realize that 40% of children will go to sleep tonight without their father in the house. 40%. No fatherly example present. No true model of masculinity, strength, and responsibility for them in the home. And boys, yes, boys especially, who have a father with them in their youth will most likely remain crime-free. There's a direct connection here, it's obvious, a direct connection with overwhelming evidence to demonstrate it. More than a few young men are procreating without providing for the children that they have begotten. And there is certainly a shirking of the duty, their duty, and it's led to a culture of irresponsibility. In addition, this vicious cycle seems to continue and develop where those Young people who were raised in fatherless families tend to imitate the actions of those that left them. Some women, in some cases, have decided to raise families to have children without a male even being present. Don't need them anymore. As time goes by, the father's position, that role of providing, protecting, guiding, guarding those in his charge has been seen as something passé, something outdated, something of the past. And as a result, more than a few men have become emasculated. That is, their masculinity, their manhood, their paternal instincts, their good aggression has been ripped out of them. And we know that this creates problems. Because we know that the family is obviously the foundation of the human society. As no chain is stronger than its links, society is no stronger than the permanent unity of the families that compose it. Every irreligious force that has ever existed in the world seeks to destroy society by directly attacking the family, the Christian home in particular. True good parents beget children. They nourish them. They clothe them. They educate them, they love them, and they give them an identity. They give them a family name. In the past, when society was more Christian, things were far more civilized, and families looked to what? To the Holy Family as their shining example. The pagan families in the ancient world had no such example, and they were obviously quite dysfunctional. Women were considered no more than slaves. Husband was master, not just head of the house. And of course, the very life of the child or children depended upon the disposition of the dad. You literally infanticide was present, where the Roman nobleman could say, I don't want that infant anymore. And that infant could be disposed of, literally. And as a result, pagan society was barbaric. And life was cheap, and things were very cold spiritually. But when the Son of God became man, he became obedient to a human father and a human mother at Nazareth. The child was considered a most precious gift from the Heavenly Father himself. The situation of the Holy Family also elevated the worth and the status of the woman. What greater woman is there? And the Blessed Mother, she is elevated above all human creatures. And yes, 
Think about the family being raised to its place, to a place even of glory in the Holy Family. The Holy Family, therefore, healed families, and it still does. It strengthened families, and it still does. And therefore, it heals society. The Son of God and Son of Mary being born into a real human family, having a real fatherly figure to follow. This sanctifies the family and provides a perfect example for family life. Today, however, Christian family totters as a pagan-like era, a neo-pagan era, returns. Countless divorces rend the bonds of matrimony and defile the sacredness of the home. Many children find themselves confused and saddened by having parents other than those that actually begot them, or not having any parents at all. Day by day, court-ordered separations wreak havoc upon the family. And wherever the notion of Christian family has been severely damaged, Christian society necessarily has disintegrated. With this crisis in the family, our cry of alarm should be, go back to Nazareth, return to the model, the greatest model of all, the Holy Family. In that litany of St. Joseph, which we prayed together yesterday, there's that title given to Joseph. St. Joseph, head of the Holy Family, pray for us. What a privilege to be the head, the guide, the protector of the Holy Family. We know, of course, that our dearest Savior was not conceived physically by a human father. Yet the church is never tired of insisting on the fatherhood of St. Joseph in the Holy Family because it's crucially important that we understand there's two levels of fatherhood. There's a physical level providing the sort of seed for the conception of human body. In this biological sense, obviously Christ did not have a human father. But a father isn't there simply to cooperate with his wife in generating a child. He's also there to cooperate in rearing the offspring. I mean, what's the primary purpose of marriage? It is the begetting and raising of children. From all eternity, Joseph was destined to be the true spouse of the Blessed Virgin. And he was chosen. He would be the man worthy of her. You know, we sometimes say, if you ever want to know the worth and the dignity of the Blessed Virgin, simply say this, she was the worthy mother of God. You want to know the worth and dignity of St. Joseph? He was the worthy husband of the Blessed Virgin Mary. From all eternity, Joseph was destined to be that spouse of the Virgin, as well as a true fatherly influence and example of manhood for the Christ child. Joseph, if you will, became an icon of God the Father for the Christ child. Whereas the hymn, one hymn in honor of St. Joseph said, he is the shadow of God the Father in the life of the Christ child. Now I realize the Son of God and Son of Mary knows all things. He's omniscient, obviously. Therefore, he knows the essence of manhood. He created it. Yet our Lord can still, as St. Thomas teaches, he can learn something in a new way. Through his sacred humanity, he can experience masculinity. He can experience manhood, the fatherhood of a human father. And this comes through the perfect example in mediation of Joseph. Christ saw perfect masculinity and perfect fatherhood. In St. Joseph. Therefore, Joseph is a prototype. He is the example for every father, spiritual, a priest, and also natural for a dad at home. We know that there are many men today, it's a rampant problem. They procreate without providing. 
They generate and then they abandon or even tell the woman to abort. True and real fatherhood, however, begins with a lifetime commitment of that husband to his wife. True fatherhood builds on a selfless love of the husband for his wife to the point that he would literally lay down his life for his spouse. And of course, that true fatherhood continues with the generous love of the offspring, all the offspring of his wife. A true Christian gentleman, therefore, seeks to imitate every aspect of the litany of St. Joseph. Think of those words. Joseph most just. A father is to be just. A man is to be just. Joseph most chaste. Marital chastity. How that has been forgotten. Marital chastity. It exists. Most prudent. Joseph most prudent. Joseph most obedient to the divine providence of God. Joseph also most faithful, most valiant. For fathers are called to protect their wives and to protect their children from the plots of modern day Herods who exist and they're inspired to destroy the Christian family as instruments of the devil. You know, since the fall of Adam and Eve, our first parents, that first sin of our first parents, there's three main problems that afflict the human race. And they are pride, carnal, fleshy sensuality, and greed. Pride, concupiscence of the flesh, and concupiscence of the eyes. Those three things. Think about it. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They disobeyed the good Lord and sought to gain heaven on their own terms. Eat this fruit and you shall be gods. They exhibited a pride, a disordered love of self, a refusal to submit to the good Lord and his order of things. They could have had any fruit from any tree in the entire garden, all for them except for one tree. But they exhibited also carnal sensuality. Their passions began to move. Why? Because their lower appetites then began to long for the food. As the Bible states, the fruit was pleasing to the eyes and good for food. And finally, they fell prey to greed because they coveted. And yes, they stole the forbidden fruit. They are thieves. And since the fall of Adam and Eve, these three things, pride, sensuality, and greed, afflict us and also afflict each member of the human family and families in general. They hurt families, these three things. They hurt parents. They hurt grandparents. They hurt children. They hurt siblings. The healing of the human family, the making of a true holy family in your home can only be brought about by conquering these three afflictions, pride, sensuality, and greed. At the time of our Lord's holy birth, and holy it was, midnight on December 25th, there was also another family nearby, only six miles away. And that particular family was filled with these problems. It was the family of King Herod the Great. The family of King Herod was filled with pride. There was a perverse ambition present along with much jealousy. There was sensuality, including adultery, sodomy, and dear Lord, also even incest. And yes, they had greed, lots of it, filthy riches and ill-gotten gain. Herod the Great came to power by killing off all of his rivals. Herod killed his wife's grandfather, as well as ordering the murder of his own brother-in-law. He executed his mother-in-law, and then, for good measure, he murdered one of his wives. The only offense of all these victims of his bloodthirsty desires was that they were popular with the people. Altogether, Herod the Great had ten wives and numerous children, but he also had his mistresses on the side. 
Family disputes or disagreements did not often end well in his family. Herod killed many of his own sons. For these, he saw them as potential rivals. And this caused the Roman emperor at that time, the famous Caesar Augustus, to say, it is better and safer to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons. And knowing that he was soon to die from a life of sin and overindulgence, King Herod commanded that all the chief Jewish men of his kingdom be slaughtered as soon as he passed away. And why this most gruesome order? So there would be at least some grieving when he passed away. Thank the good Lord that this horrible mandate was never carried out. Instead, the Jews celebrated the day of his death as a festival. It's no surprise then that that same King Herod the Great also killed the holy innocents of Bethlehem. Tradition saying 72 little boys in all, all circumcised, all members of God's people at that time, suffering as martyrs because he was looking to kill the Christ child, another potential rival. Yet just six miles away from this highly dysfunctional family was the Holy Family. And they rejected the vices of pride, concupiscence of the flesh, and that also of the eyes. And this Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph is a true model of help in restoring the human family from all those things that afflict us. Consider good St. Joseph St. Joseph was of the royal line of King David. He was royalty, the last of the great patriarchs and royalty. He was of the kingly tribe of Judah, the true rulers of Israel. And outside of Our Lady, good St. Joseph stands out as the second greatest saint in heaven above. But though a descendant of King David, a prophet, and composer of psalms, Joseph rejects human pride and embraces the humiliations of being under Roman occupation. He's not allowed to have a throne. The Romans have taken control. King David, it is said in the Bible, pridefully took a census. He wanted to count God's holy people out of pride, wanting to somehow show how great his kingdom was. And as a result, David brought down a plague upon the people through that sin of counting the people as if they were his own. And as for Joseph, he initially, out of humility, sought to withdraw humbly from Our Lady and the child that was within her, seeing himself as unworthy to wed her who was the spouse of the Holy Ghost. Joseph never questioned Mary's holy Purity. He never questioned her physical virginity, but he knew that somehow God had brought this about and he was unworthy to be even the presence of the ark of God's covenant. But having received a dream from an angel to take his place as head of the Holy Family, Joseph embraced his role. Because that's what humility is. Humility is knowing your place and taking your place. Humility is truth. Humility is knowing the truth and living the truth. Joseph may not have authored the book of Psalms like King David. He may not have recorded anything in the Holy Bible, no words that are recorded. Yet the silent Joseph, the silent Joseph, this, this gives us the heights of his mystical unit he would have had with the Most High. That silent Joseph that brought him right next to the very throne of Our Lady at the very foot of the Holy Trinity. And yes, he became the patron of the new Israel. He is the king of the new Israel, the Joseph of the new Israel, watching over as a patron and protector of the church. King David, according to the inerrant Holy Bible, fell prey to carnal sensuality, fell prey to lust. 
as he entered into that adulterous union with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, lust so dominated the heart of David that he attempted to cover up his infidelity by having Uriah, for all intents and purposes, murdered on the battlefield. The record also demonstrates that David was a shepherd boy that became the richest man in all Israel. As the Bible said, David died in good old age, full of days, full of riches, and full of glory. Yet good St. Joseph was pure at all times, a most chaste spouse, a virginal spouse of Our Lady that had consecrated his virginal state to the Most High at 12 years old. How sick and tired we should be in depicting St. Joseph as some old guy, some old guy who had already spent his youth and that somehow was just a father figure to the Blessed Mother. That is an unfortunate way to protect Our Lady's perpetual virginity. No, he was of marriageable age, as tradition tells us. He was young, virile, a working man, not a retiree. And he gave himself to God in virginal consecration, like Our Lady did. And Joseph also lived a simple life, a modest life. Though a king, a royal king, he lived not in a palace, he lived in a simple house, even temporarily in a cave. He was also a laborer, a laborer who worked with his hands, a man who earned his living and provided for his family by the sweat of his brow. Again, in that first letter of St. John, these three things that afflict us is mentioned. St. John calls it the pride of life, the concupiscence of the flesh, and the concupiscence of the eyes. Fallen men are inclined towards pride to the point that they place themselves as if they were God. That is the ultimate pride. Men began to live a lie, to put themselves in place of the Creator instead of being a simple creature. The Holy Ghost, as we know, is a spirit of truth, whose office, whose duty is to strengthen the faith of the believers and to bestow them with wisdom and knowledge and to confirm them in the teachings of our holy faith. Because the truth, dear people, is a person. The truth is a person, a divine person who came in the flesh, the Son of God and Son of Mary. And the Holy Ghost witnesses to Christ, who is the truth. And so when we are in conformity with Christ, we are in conformity with the truth. And what is truth? Truth is what it is. Things exist are what they are. There is truth. And because there is truth, we can study and we can investigate and we can have our questions answered. Our mind is not meant to create pridefully its own reality, which so many do today. The primary function of the mind is to discover the truth and to conform humbly to Christ, who is the truth, and to humbly embrace the order that he has established. Therefore, the human mind is not independent. Free thinkers? No. That's the Enlightenment. That's Freemasonry. No human mind is independent. We are supposed to conform ourselves to the truth. It has no license to create its own version of the truth. Things are what they are. But in this modern world in which we live, the spirit of truth has been thrust aside in favor of the spirit of deception from the father of lies. In the beginning, it is said that Adam named the things of creation. The beasts were brought before him and he gave them proper names. He named them as they were. We need to give things their proper name. We need to reconnect with the nature of things. 
But as that original sin committed by our first parents was to embrace the lie spoken by the serpent, so deceit rules the day in this modern world. We are living a lie. It is all around us. Most slogans today that the world presents to us, most slogans today are simply lies. They're a corruption of our language. We're told that a woman soldier can fight just as well as a male soldier on the battlefield. And we know it's a lie, but we still swallow it because we wouldn't want to be bigots or discriminatory. We're told that sodomitical couples can unite and even marry, and that they're just at as good at parenting as a real mom and dad. It's a total lie. But it's embraced by most people today, including most Catholics. We're told that gender is purely fluid, liable to change the social construction, nothing to do with biology. That a boy can be a girl, a girl can be a boy. That's if they identify as such. It's a lie. We're told that there's 12 years left before the earth will be destroyed. And you know what? Mass education, mass news media, mass entertainment impose these thoughts upon us. History books tell us that the Catholic Church is the enemy of freedom. And the church killed millions at the stake, and the church actually was a main cause for the genocide of the Jews. We are told that the unborn child is just a blob of, blob of flesh. We are told that diversity is our strength, even though we know it's often our greatest weakness. And yes, we live in an age of agendas, not truth, agendas. What is the cure? We must humbly embrace reality. Things are what they are. We need to look at the nature of things, and we need to read good books to educate ourselves. Most of us don't really know a good wild mushroom from a poisonous one in the forest. Most of us don't know what kind of bait to use to catch a certain fish. We don't know where to look for Jupiter in the night sky. We don't know how to properly tap a maple tree and maybe one day get maple syrup. We're often strangers to the world and we're strangers to the nature around us. But we're not strangers to the lies because they're fed to us every single day. Of course, this spirit of deception also finds place within the membership of Holy Mother Church. We're told by many that hell exists, but <laughs> there's a good hope that it's probably empty. No one really goes there. God couldn't be that mean. We're told that purgatory is simply a medieval fable, something of the past which our unenlightened ancestors perhaps believed in. We're said and told that St. Paul was misogynist. He hated women. Lies, lies, and more lies. Our Lord did not know he was God, they tell us, until perhaps after his baptism, maybe even on the cross. Lie. Martin Luther was a great reformer who did not mean to bring about divisions, lies, and more lies. The Holy Ghost inspired the, religion, the founders of all religions, we are told. Lie. Mary's virginity wasn't so much a physical reality, but really only a moral one. She never had relations. Lie. It's okay for Catholics to worship in a non-Catholic way. It's almost impossible to commit a mortal sin. I can't see how it could happen. And yes, men have the right to follow whatever religion they want according to their conscience. Lie. The Crusades and the Inquisition were pure evils that violated the gospel of Christ, even though they were preached by St. Bernard and St. Louis IX fought in one or two. Marriage for life is an ideal, but it can't be expected of all couples. The use of contraceptives to regulate birth, again, is not an ideal, but you can't expect it of every single couple. 
we need to learn and appreciate the love that is present in same-sex unions. It's a lie. Lies and more lies. We can never condemn. We must always affirm. Muslims and Christians worship the same exact God. It's a lie. The mystical body of Christ is found in other religious groups. Lie. Salvation and the means of sanctification can be found outside the Catholic Church, so why become Catholic? Lie. And the list goes on and on. More and more lies spoken by prideful men. The truth must be restored. And humility is truth. Pride is a lie. We need the restoration of truth-telling. And we need to hate the lies of the prideful serpent who sought a throne above his station. And we need Joseph to show us the humble way that rejects the pride of life. But we also need Joseph to help us remain pure. Pure while dwelling in the midst of this modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah. Because it is filled with carnal sensuality. You know, a few years ago, I was preaching at a Catholic homeschool conference in Virginia. And at the conclusion of that event, I took a few hours to visit a Civil War battlefield known as Chancellorsville. In particular, I wanted to visit a monument that marked the spot where the famous Confederate general, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, was mistakenly shot by some of his own troops. Jackson was a graduate of West Point, a highly decorated officer due to his acts of valor in one of the wars. And when the conflict sort of began, known as the Civil War, he was there at First Manassas, or also known as First Bull Run, in July of 1861. In fact, there at that battle, he received his famous nickname. Because inspired by Jackson's brave resolve in the face of the enemy, sitting upon his horse as bullets were flying by him, another officer called out saying, Look, men, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall. Let us determine to die here, and we will conquer. Jackson's courage was evident. His military skills were unequaled. Even the great General Robert E. Lee depended upon Stonewall for his support. But this great military figure would not make it to the war's end, for he was accidentally wounded and, yes, killed by friendly fire at that battle of Chancellorsville. Jackson was shot twice, one through the left arm, another through the right hand, by infantrymen from North Carolina. I saw the place where he was shot, and the monument to Stonewall Jackson marked the spot where he fell from his horse. Eventually, a doctor would remove his left arm just below the shoulder in an effort to save his life. In the days that followed, Jackson's condition only declined. He got pneumonia, and eight days later, he died. His famous last words were, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. Jackson was buried in a cemetery in Lexington, Virginia, and that cemetery is now called, at least for now, the Stonewall Jackson Memorial Cemetery. Men like this are rightly honored for bravery, and they had many natural virtues as well as the willingness to sacrifice a lot for their cause. But at the exact same moment that I was at that site visiting the Stonewall Monument at Chancellorsville, our previous president dedicated another Stonewall Monument. Of course, this monument had nothing to do with the Confederate general, for many of our revolutionaries who govern our country today despise our past heroes 
and they cast aspersions upon those we once honored. Wallowing in self-hate, these modern revolutionaries would have us destroy our national heritage and start afresh. All revolutionaries seek to destroy the old order, then begin a new, fresh start. This newer monument refers to the stone wall in, forgive me, a queer bar that was a scene of uprisings by various sodomites against law enforcement that sought to shut down such perverse sites in the past. The Stonewall Uprising is considered by many to be the catalyst that launched the modern LGBTQ civil rights movement. In the month of June 2014, which the previous president made June Pride Month, the month of the Sacred Heart is also Pride Month, Our previous president designated the area around the Stonewall Inn in New York City as the country's first national monument to LGBTQ rights. This week, I'm designated, the president stated, the Stonewall National Federal Monument as the newest addition to America's park system. America's national park system now includes a bar. The monument designation consists of nearly eight acres, protecting the Greenwich Village Bar, Christopher Park across the street, and several other streets and sidewalks nearby. Our modern liberal elites will see this as a holy site, holy ground, where pilgrims pay their respects. But in reality, it marks Sodom and Gomorrah, USA. It is a shrine to impurity. It's a sodomitical sanctuary. It's a temple for the praise and glory of carnal lust and sensuality. So from a monument dedicated to General Thomas Stonewall Jackson at Chancellorsville, we now have a national federal monument, an official national park, out of a sodomitical bar. Such a thing should cause any man to weep. I am homophobic. Maybe not in the clinical sense. But I am a homophobe because I fear what the lifestyle of Sodom will do to the Western world. Men who engage in this activity have the shortest lifespan on earth. It is utterly harmful to the soul and to the body. Just imagine what it does to the soul of a man who is dominated by the passion of lust. A person can become blinded, and that blindness of lust almost always leads to violence. Almost always leads to violence. Can't control that appetite. Probably can't control anger either. Any nation that embraces and accepts this perverse behavior is a nation that is dying, that is losing hope, because that behavior is part of the culture of death. It is fruitless. It is infertile. It perfectly describes what the culture of death is. Divine chastisement is soon to come unless there are those who are willing to Resist this onslaught of evil to make reparation for this crime against nature. St. Peter Damien, the renowned Benedictine monk and bishop, once said the following about this unnatural vice that destroyed the five cities, including Sodom and Gomorrah. He said that without fail, this vice brings death to the body and destruction to the soul. He continued, it pollutes the flesh, extinguishes the light of the mind, expels the Holy Ghost from the temple of the human heart, and gives entrance to the devil, the stimulator of lust. Yes, for St. Peter Damien, this lifestyle opens up hell and closes the gates of paradise. You might say, why speak of this, Father? It's because this particular behavior is also present 
in what we would call normal marriage today. What is the contraceptive mentality if not sodomy? It is infertile, it is fruitless, and it's present in many marriages today. St. Joseph is the key for men especially seeking holy purity, for those individuals who wish to be chaste according to their state in life, for those seeking marital chastity, which exists and should exist in any marriage, purity within the marital act, for those seeking chastity in the single state as they await what the good Lord wants for them in life, and for those seeking perfect chastity, complete chastity within the religious consecrated life and within the holy priesthood. Joseph is our model, and he is the great intercessor for those who seek that virtue of purity. And our dearest God loves purity. Blessed are those who are pure of heart, for they shall see God. Impurity blinds people. Purity allows us to see God. And our God especially loves virginity. We don't speak about this like the ancient church did. St. Ambrose, the church fathers, they wrote about virginity consecrated for the kingdom of God all the time. St. Greg of Nazianzen, a doctor and father of the church, taught the following. He said the Holy Trinity is the first virgin of all. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is the first virgin of all. The Heavenly Father eternally, and yes, virginally, brings forth His only begotten Son in all spiritual purity. And then, of course, from the two, Father and Son, and a most pure love, virginally proceeds the Holy Ghost. And so when the very Son of God chose to become man... He wished to have virginity present in his earthly birth as it was present in his eternal nativity, his eternal birth. And so he chose a virgin for a mother purposely. A virgin shall conceive and a virgin shall give birth to a son. And yes, he chose a foster father. Could St. Joseph, as the virginal spouse of Our Lady, who consecrated his virginity to the good Lord at a young age, our dearest Lord loves purity, and he loves virginity chosen for the sake of heaven even more. By the grace of God and the holy intercession of St. Joseph, we can be protected from carnal sensuality. But finally, to end this conference this evening, what about the notion of greed? The concupiscence or the lust of of the eyes, material gain. You know, when you read the Holy Bible, you read about the Garden of Eden, the inerrant sacred history of Genesis. Before the fall of man, before that original sin, there was a paradise of pleasure. That's what Eden was called, a paradise of true pleasure. And Adam and Eve were utterly happy. Our first parents walked with the good Lord they were utterly satisfied and they possessed the good Lord as their true and ultimate wealth. And yet, when you read that history of Genesis, there's no mention of mammon, as our Lord would call it, in the Garden of Eden. No material riches and wealth. There's no undue attachment to material things in the Garden. There's no disordered love of worldly goods. In fact, there's no mention of really any worldly goods seemingly in the garden. No mention of mansions in the Garden of Eden. Where'd they sleep? How many bathrooms did they have? No mention of resort areas. Didn't they have a golf course? No luxury items. No insistence on the absolute right of private property. Don't touch my stuff. No mention of fine silks or furs. Jewelry, rich garments, no multiple shoes and closets. In fact, they were shoeless. And yet they had all they needed, completely happy. 
With the fall of Adam and Eve, our first parents lost the gift of sanctifying grace. And they and their children also lost their love for the simple life. And in many cases, they developed a taste for mammon. Material gains, more and more, perhaps a bit of hoarding too, began to creep into the human race. Excessive attachments to material things, riches, and greedily pursuing riches as if material wealth were the primary goal in life. Remember the famous Calvin Coolidge, famous good president of the past, America's business is business. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. How many houses? How many yachts? How many cars? The fall of man, and what a fall it was. From a utopian paradise, we fell into some sort of dystopian society with a love for material wealth. From the innocent Adam, detached from the things of this earth, we now have the likes of various Scrooges, misers, who often in some cases will abuse and defraud various Bob Cratchits. The Scrooge mentality, it is present today. The Scrooge mentality of denying a just wage to a worker, setting unjust prices or price gouging, gaining usurious profits from lending to those in need of borrowing money, only pursuing the profit motive instead of the notion of protecting the common good and human labor, promoting the gospel of the free market, more doctrinal than even the gospel of Christ in many people's minds, this notion of a laissez-faire system, let, let this market naturally sort of take care of itself. Everything will be fine. Some invisible hand will make all things right. This is an unquestionable dogma. The adoration of the concept of free trade, though it very well made this manufacturing base of a nation, turning machinists into men who flip burgers, and demanding also that right to natural property, no matter the circumstances, those that might have needs, those who might be even starving. Defending child labor, why not? Exploiting workers in sweatshops, or as Scrooge would take it, are there no workhouses still around? Claiming that no worker is ever underpaid, as long as he agrees and consents to the contract. And no CEO is ever overpaid and so many other Scrooge-like concepts that have created the concentration of wealth and necessarily power in the hands of a few who can literally change whole nations, whole continents through their maneuverings. And yet Scrooge would have his defenders today, even amongst traditional conservative Catholics. Libertarianism has become very fashionable amongst many a traditionalist, but it's nothing more than another form of liberalism condemned by the church. Any form of liberalism, liberalism in morality, liberalism in politics, liberalism in religion, or liberalism in economics, which is libertarianism, is condemned. Liberalism is a sin, if you ever read that book put out by Tam Publishers in years past. Any form of liberalism is against Christ the King and his church. The libertarian who speaks about free markets and unregulated economy, or this beauty of unrestricted capitalism shows his liberal colors, as well as his naivete in regard to original sin and the problem of greed. Have we forgotten about greed? To show how ridiculous this notion is, just change the phrase from free markets to free love. Just, just change it around for a bit. No need to regulate those matters surrounding the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. Libertarians always support pornography. I mean, it's a man's liberal choice. We shouldn't have limitation on choices, right? We're liberal. Free love, no need to regulate those matters surrounding the reproductive act. Don't worry about the vice of lust. Let the young people have some fun alone. 
Everything will work out fine. There will be an invisible hand that will guide the youth so they won't fall. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, since the fall of our first parents, three main problems have afflicted the human race. These three things are pride, carnal sensuality, and greed. And St. Joseph never fell prey to any of these issues. By the grace of God and the intercession of good St. Joseph, true husband of Mary, and foster fathers of the Christ child, may we be healed from these afflictions by becoming truly humble, truly pure, and truly poor in spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.